Okay, you're done. All of the hard work is done, and now it's mission accomplished. So what's next? Because with your degree from ITI, you'll have the tools you need to have a better life. And the reason we do this is you. We want to foster your dreams, your plans, and the hope for your future with a quality education. Our tagline is for a better life, so you can actually live the life you've always dreamed of. And it can all begin here at ITI, where we're invested in your future. I'm Lee Feinswag, and this is Sports 225. And not just any Sports 225. This is the 25th year of the show. We started with Sports Monday, continued it into Sports 225, and now, a quarter century later, here we are. Sports 225 is sponsored by Breck. And now, me. Well, you might have heard that LSU played a football game last Saturday against Alabama. And my guest, Brooks Cabina's life has revolved totally around that game before, during, and since. Even though the game's over and LSU plays Ole Miss this week, I would imagine still out of Alabama on the brain. Uh, absolutely. I mean, it's the talk for the last couple of days. Uh, everything's been built up for eight years. And the thing is, these players are, 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 are you know, admitting that. You know, talking to Rashard Lawrence on Monday, he's just like, you know, it, it'd be kind of dumb not to acknowledge the fact that this thing was as big as it was. And... I mean, just the manner of which they won the game, too. I mean, they were, they were blowing Alabama out in the first half. 33-13, this was clearly a team that was better. And, you know, there was some uh, push and pull in the second half. But, I mean, to, to vault to number one for the first time in college football playoff history, it's, it's as big as it could get for LSU. Well, there were a couple things that I, I came away with in that game. There were, there were um, three things in particular. One was the fumble by two on the first possession which I never said on television, I don't know if you caught this on the replay, but I thought that the ball slipped off the plastic piece mm. that he uses to protect the plays that he reads. It almost looked like it went right off of that. It's kind of weird, but that was no doubt a huge element of the game at that point because of the tone it could have set for Alabama. Yeah, that was the swing. Uh, yeah. Alabama drove down really easily boom, to boom, get boom. down there. Right. And it, it almost felt, it felt status quo, like here comes Alabama again marching yeah. in. And uh, I'm not saying that LSU wouldn't have countered, but uh, that, was, that was kind of the thing. Uh, people are talking about the breaks that Alabama had. There were also breaks for LSU. And I think they've kind of neutralized each other too, mm -hmm. because LSU, uh, you know, whenever they had the punt return for a touchdown, Alabama, Racy McMath, their gunner, was there. And actually probably could have been called for hands to the face at some point, but yeah. he slipped out of his grip and went 77 yards. So that first half, had a lot of gimmicks, a lot of things that kind of went both ways for both teams, but uh, definitely was, was something that was interesting to see from Tua right to start off the game. Yeah, I mean, I was, I was stunned with, uh, well, one of the things I was going to talk about later, and you mentioned Tua, was it, I was really glad that the camera captured at the end uh, Blake Ferguson going over to, uh, you know, shake hands with him yeah. because I think the LSU players probably recognized what this guy did. And I, I got the impression that even though it was a chippy game because it's football, that there was a lot of mutual respect during and after the game for each other. Because, I mean, they had to recognize there were a lot of guys who might be teammates in a couple of years. Sure, and, and uh, LSU outside linebacker Caleb on he, he talked about this on Monday, too. In recruiting, in high school, you go to different events uh, across, the, across the, uh, the country. And, you know, Leatherwood, their left tackle, was someone that always beat him consistently. He admitted, he's like, I'll, I'm not even going to lie to you, like, that was personal. You know, in high school, yeah. he had this one arm stiff that I just couldn't get past. And he, he got to him in the game. Yeah. And he's like, I'm glad that it was a good battle. I'm, I'm glad after this. And, I, and there is that respect because whenever a team of that caliber is playing a team of another, I think they get a sense of how special that is. And um, not only just to be a part of it, but to win, mm -hmm. it, 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 it gives you uh, something to realize that you are the best at that point. And I think. Uh, Alabama's experienced that themselves enough to realize the gravity of it as well. And I think both teams, once the game was over, handled it very professionally. Yeah, no, I was glad about that. So to continue on my extraneous lines of thought, <laughs> so one thing that Joe Burrow is just lethal, and, and if he, the wrestler didn't already have the name, I'd call him Stone Cold. But like at the end of the half, when they got the ball back, the first of the two possessions, I said they're going to win the game now because of what's going to happen 
because LSU got the ball back unexpectedly, then to have gotten it back twice. And he's just deadly there. Ridiculous. They were very good on third down. I mm -hmm. think when you look at how Alabama played their offense first half to second half, they were there to make a lot of these plays. And yes, Joe Burrow was a very large part of that, but they brought the house on a third down and got to Joe Burrow and he released it just in time mm -hmm. down the sideline. And Clyde yeah. Edwards Elaire caught with his fingertips out there. And the, all the players were there. The cornerback was there to make the play. Yeah. But I think one of the biggest things is how much this meant to the LSU players and how that affected on the field. And Clyde showed that more than anyone. Well, and, he, and he bore into that cornerback and drove through him eight yards to get that first down. And, I, you know, that, those were the things that kind of stuck out to me was their emotions leveled up the play on the field and, and, and transcended a lot of the uh, offense that they were running at that time. Well, and then my next point was is that going into the game, I, th I said that somebody, if this game goes to form, two great teams that should play something for the memory books, that somebody will establish himself in the lore of the game. And there's no doubt that Clyde Edwards Hilaire did. I mean, five foot eight, you know, and I was thinking about going back and looking at other running backs. You know, Barry Sanders was five eight. Um, Maurice Jones Drew is five eight. You know, uh, an LSU running back um, long before your time, Dalton Hilliard, <laughs> might have been shorter than that, you know, um, and, but a different kind of guy. But this kid, for what he did for that one game, and he only had 102 yards or something, but he cemented himself in the lore of LSU football. I think, I think he definitely did. Ed Ogeron said Monday that in his 35 years of coaching, he hasn't seen another performance quite like that. And this is a guy who's been around guys like Reggie Bush. So it says a lot. And he had, a, he had about 200 total yards of all-purpose all offense, mm -hmm. Clyde edwards Hilaire did, 77 yards receiving. But, yeah, that, that peg has been against him all his life, being short. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, we're in the age where we've seen people transcend that in all capacity of sport. Kyler Murray was like that last year. You see it in baseball with Jose Altuve with the Houston Astros. I don't think size, his height, really went into the things that uh, – went against him. I really think it's mostly was his speed. I mean, the people who actually went and looked at him in high school and evaluated him, it's the breakaway speed that was lacking in a lot of people's eyes. And I think whenever uh, sometimes that can be overvalued with running backs. And, and once they get into the open field, you want them to house it. Uh, but I think what you saw against Alabama, the other value that Clyde edwards Elaire brings to uh, the running back that helps in the NFL is that you're going to get hit quickly. How do you handle tight spaces and being uh, tackled? Can you get out of the grips of guys after the first hit? And that really is what impressed me the most about him. And he's shown that throughout the years. He can spin his way out of tackles. He can break through guys. And I think, that's, I think that is a, a step above um, you know, what, what, what people might downgrade him if he didn't have the breakaway speed because he brings a totally different element of the game that might be more valuable. Well, if LSU goes on to win the national championship when ESPN does the 30 for 30 and then interview Brooks Cabina like 10 years from now on the look back, he'll be talking about Clyde Edwards. I will. Yeah, I'll love to do it. <laughs> you will. Um, he, I never even introduced him and said what he does, but he's a sports <laughs> writer. He covers LSU football for The Advocate. Read his stuff at theadvocate.com and then your uh, Twitter handle, is it B Cabina? Yeah, B-K-U-B-E-N-A. Yeah. Yep, there you go. Um, we're way over on this segment. We'll keep talking LSU Alabama football when we get back. I'm Lee Feinswag at Sports 225. Back out of the chaos. We're back on Sports 225, hanging out with Brooks Cabina, the sports writer for the Advocate, who covers LSU and the SEC. And uh, we were talking in the first segment primarily about the LSU Alabama football game. But uh, I'm always fascinated by the next generation of sports writers. And I never was a football beat writer. I was the LSU basketball beat writer for the Advocate, um, damn near before you were born. <laughs> but um, uh, it was such a different world. But t tell people what your week is like now, um, and start with, for example, a game week. So the game ends. It's obvious what you do on game day. Mm -hmm. What was Sunday like for you? Well, Sunday is 
you're balancing a lot of things. One, the follow-up story that you're going to write for Monday's paper, uh, but I also like to break down film. I think a lot of fan response, a lot of reader response like to see breakdowns and uh, I think people are uh, nowadays with all the technology that you can use, the intricacies of a football game, they appreciate uh, reporters who try to do as much as they do. Um, so that's what I balance and then also preparing for uh, Monday. So coming so you, back from you, Alabama was a long drive and doing all that at the same time. Yeah. Somebody else was driving, I hope. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Yes. I won't say um, that I haven't written a story while I drive, but, but driven before. Oh, God, but. please, please. <laughs> no, no. See, he, he came to the Advocate too late. Back when I worked there, we had a company plane. So it, it was like a one-hour flight to most SEC destinations. You'd yeah, that would be like, great. Oh, we'd leave at like 2 in the afternoon for a basketball game, say at Auburn, land, mm. go eat some dinner, go to the game. Sometimes, you know, and then we'd write. And uh, if we thought we'd be home early enough, we'd actually write on the plane and then file the story as soon as we got to the airport. Um, oh, uh, those were the days. But, um, yeah, because it reduces the wear and tear on your body of a long season. That's for you know, that, sure. Yeah, you take a, you take a one-hour flight versus a six-hour drive. I mean, also, yeah. the flights are great. I like going on away games where you have to fly because sometimes when you're up in the air and that cell phone signal is gone, it's almost like the only time you get to relax because Maybe. you're like, all right, I'm yeah. not getting buzzed by Twitter notifications and emails and whatever. <laughs> I can just... Sleep. Some of the best sleeps I've ever had during a football season are being on planes. That's fair. I wish I could sleep on planes. <laughs> oh, God. So um, do you watch the, you, the replay of the CBS broadcast, or do you watch a different um, video broadcast? Uh, I watch different ones. Uh, YouTube is great, actually. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of people out there who uh, sometimes do games in under 35 minutes. They cut out, oh, yeah. they cut out a lot of the, the, the talk, the commercials, and everything, and you can see play to play to play, and that makes it really easy. For me, so whoever's running those things, I appreciate it. Um, <laughs> but you know, that's that's how I look at it, and yeah. I and I do want to be able to look back on a game because you know, as a writer, um, during the game, you're writing the story and trying to put it into context, and you're missing some plays every now and then. I have to look up at the screen that they have in the booth and see the replay and yeah. uh, check check the stats that are that are uh, on on live time. So you do miss things, and I, I think it's very important to go back and look. Yeah, no, that's good. All right, so that's Sunday, then Monday. Mm -hmm. Monday is press conference. Uh, exactly. Ed Ogeron talked yesterday. Players talked that afternoon. Um, Monday morning, I usually have an idea of what I want to write about, so I'm doing a lot of prep work, um, you know, digging through film. I watched, rewatched the game Monday morning again, and uh, I knew that I was going to write about Caleb on Chase on because he had a heck of a game um, on Saturday and worked out because Ed said in his presser that that was the best game that Caleb on's played. I mean, his most complete game. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's a 12-hour day. I wake up at 7.30, and they end up talking at 5.45, and then I file my story by 7.30, and I go home and try and get ready for Tuesday morning, and I get texts from people like Lee Feinswag to see if I want to come <laughs> talk. And I'm like, I'm tired, man. <laughs> this was prearranged. I didn't get them on the morning, <laughs> just so you know, but we had a plan in advance because this week is crazy. Tuesday is your one slower day, though, right? Yeah, by, by this point... Um, by, by Tuesday, you know, I've uh, you know, got more of what I got from Monday uh, with all the players. I have a better idea of what I'm writing about Wednesday, and I can usually file my story pretty early. And then it's really focus on the game day story because we do Saturdays very big. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's like a Wednesday, dedicate. Thursday, and Friday or about. That, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, and still, um, and you've reminded me there are a few things that I still need to take care of because mm -hmm. we do different sections in the game day like, I remember last year, we, we, we try to be creative and uh, give readers something that they're interested in. And I was like, you know what? There, there's sports gamblers out there. They want to know. Yeah, and yeah. I don't know about all these lines and what they mean. I want to act like I do. So let's call somebody that does. And every Saturday, there's been a section in there. We call it Inside the Betting Line. And someone I've reached out to gives us basically his thoughts on a question that I ask. So yeah. those, are, those are the kind of things that I work on, too. Well, it's amazing how the bookies are so, I mean, the score, if you think about what was the, the ultimate final spread going into that game Saturday was about six and a half, seven. Yeah. You know, so LSU covered, but barely, All right? 46, 41, five, five points. Yep. Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, no, so it didn't. Oh, no, so, yeah, right. so LSU wasn't favored. So right, Alabama right. was favored yeah, yeah, on the yeah, other yeah. end. So they so you, won straight yeah. up. Yeah. Uh, the, but the thing was is that the over-under was somewhere in the 50s which I was really surprised, but I thought that was really low considering the offenses that they were See, both. it's funny, you know, they combined for 80 yeah, points. It, it's funny that you say that because 
traditionally games like that, they're not both wide open and mm -hmm. there aren't the high points. You know, 50 something w is more realistic because everybody plays it close to the vest, especially in the first quarter. The defenses usually step up, but then, you, you know, that, that, that game, everything just got thrown out the window early. You know, and I think it's because of some of the sloppy play at the beginning. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's yeah. just, there just were breaks mm -hmm. to his fumble. Uh, the punt return touchdown. Uh, Derek Stingley getting caught on a trick play uh, in, a, in a touchdown from Devontae Smith. So those add to the point total. Yeah. So that's definitely part of it. And uh, maybe if you take those away, maybe it does go around 50 points. Yeah. Uh, he's Brooks Cabina. You can read his stuff at theadvocate.com. You can spend the money and buy the newspaper. Please Always do. Always still, <laughs> still a thrill. And at nola.com and the Times-Picayune. I mean, all those, all those avenues are there for you. Um, We'll talk more. I'm Lee Feinswag at Sports 225. Well, we're back on Sports 225. You know, I'm wearing a long sleeve sweatshirt, my volleyball Baton Rouge vintage sweatshirt. But uh, as we're doing the show, it's in the 30s. It's so refreshing to have some cold weather. Oh, my. It's just like, you know, I'm not a hot, humid weather kind of guy. You know, just me personally. And people say, well, you live in the wrong place. Well, duh for that. But, you know. I think for prolonged periods, I would be less okay with it. But definitely a little breeze is good every now and then. Yeah. This summer, I was in um, South Korea. And oh. where we were, it was super hot and humid, high 90s, super humidity. And I was with a bunch of guys from Canada, and they said, oh, you must be used to this. And I go, no, we're not, we don't go outside in weather like this where I live. Everybody's in air conditioning. You walk to the car, it's got air conditioning. You drive someplace, it's in air conditioning. You make sure to park in the shade. So this is very refreshing. I don't know what the temperature will be when we come out, but, uh, you know, when this airs, but who knows. Anyway, so um, LSU master of its own fate now becomes number one uh in the college football playoff rankings which is the penultimate i have said now for a month that i thought the loser of the lsu alabama football game would win the national championship i still think that still yes i think alabama will come in be healthy not have to play in the sec championship game get all that more time for all their people to heal and alabama will win the national championship i'm not backing away from that because I said it, even if I don't really think that, because it's true. <laughs> it's like I, I pick Purdue every year to win the National Basketball Championship. Every year, I'm picking Purdue again. Anyway. Probably get good odds. But LSU, LSU is certainly the master of its own fate, and can't, can't imagine this team screwing up in these next three games. You know, you never say never. Correct. But uh, LSU has performed at a very high level consistently. Uh, I think Auburn is a lot better than people thought at the beginning of the year mm -hmm. and I think that's why they're thought so high and ranked so high by the college football playoff committee so there is some merit to your Alabama talk because if Alabama does beat Auburn I think a lot of people on that committee value them very high mm -hmm. so if Alabama dominates in that game that's the only other other game they have on their schedule uh, that is of real con consequence mm -hmm. left but I think that's also what works against them because let's just say Minnesota goes to the uh, Big Ten championship. And I watched undefeated. Minnesota last week. They looked really they good. They looked really good. And if they play Ohio State tight, which I think Ohio State, if they had more ranked victories, would still be ahead of LSU. Um, and could, by the end of the year, after playing Penn State and Michigan, could be number one going into that Big Ten title game. If Minnesota's undefeated and plays that game tight, is it Minnesota that gets over Alabama over there? And I think... The other person is Oregon in this. Mm -hmm. Oregon is close to this and has one loss to Auburn, which again is thought very highly. But if Auburn loses to Alabama, that hurts their case further. So really it's the question between is it going to be a one-loss Big Ten team or a one-loss Big 12 champion because maybe Oklahoma runs the table. And if Baylor goes undefeated, I think, I think they've got to be in the college football playoff if they're an undefeated team out of a conference like that. It's uh 
curious, you know, I, I, and again, like he says, that's why they play the game. Another thing I'll throw at you, too, is that it hasn't happened this year. There's always a bloody Sunday. There's always one, and, I mean, Saturday, I'm sorry, mm. and Sunday, bloody Sunday, you too, never mind. Anyway, but um, there have been upsets, but never a Saturday where there's a bunch of them, and you just mm. go, what the hell happened today? That hasn't happened. And it, it, it always does every year. Well, wouldn't we think Georgia, South Carolina was like that? Yeah, but that's just a game. You, you mean know. like a whole Saturday oh, of a bunch of knockdowns yeah, at once? It just happens, you know. Things yeah. just get squirrely sometimes. Well, who knows? We still got three weeks. Yeah. So LSU goes to Ole Miss. Right. And by all accounts, should should just overpower and win that game very easily. You would think. Uh, last year, Ole Miss was pretty strong offensively, and they did nothing offensively in that game. Uh, I think LSU was equipped um, much better in on offense to continue to play the way they do. But I do think the pass defense... Uh, you know, there's some spots that they may be missing some players. Christian Fulton hasn't practiced in a couple of days. Neither has Kerry Vincent. You know, this whole secondary has, um, you know, they struggled against Alabama at times. Ole Miss is probably going to have its spots where they have success. Uh, and the one interesting thing about Ole Miss is that their pass rush is pretty effective. Uh, they're, they're in the top 40 nationally. And I know it's going to be one of those things that people don't really remember from Alabama because Joe Burrow played so well, but he was sacked five times in that game. Mm. He was pressured immensely. And if Ole Miss can have some success getting to Burrow, and this could be a little more tight than people think. I still think LSU is highly overmatched. Over, I mean, is, Ole Miss is highly overmatched in, in comparison to LSU, but some of these things make it a little more interesting. Well, this is your second year on the beat. That's right. So this was your first trip to Alabama to mm -hmm. see a football game. This will be your first trip to Ole Miss. Yeah. Well worth the walk around before the game. It's I a want curious to. place. It's uh, yeah, nice people. They dress nice, you know, and uh, it's just one of those fun college football experiences. Yeah, but I might have to kick uh, Scott Rabelais a little bit to get us going in the morning. You know, me and Sheldon and them. We got We're not staying in Oxford, so we got to go Ooh. up there. I got to be like, hey, look, let's let's go. Let's get, see this. The, the um, old seasoned veterans. That could be a problem. Well, you know. Uh, Usually it's me that they have to kick out of bed because, you know, Friday nights are, you know, I'm 26. You're so young and strong. <laughs> I gotta, and that's my only night to do anything. So uh, well, we'll see. It's Rabelais is going to be a grandfather. So, you know. That's true. Yes, you know, that's great. All right. He's Brooks Cabina. He covers LSU and the SEC for The Advocate. Kind enough to uh, take time out of a busy week because all of his weeks are busy to come on Sports 225. When we get back, we have time for one short segment. We're out of here. Break out of the chaos. Coming down the home stretch of another Sports 225. Go to sports225.com for all the show listings of when we're on Cox 4, which is your view, and on CST. Brooks, unscary enough, they can see us in 18 states, Oof, wherever they have Cox Sports television. Um, and then on the interwebs, I uh, have the YouTube uh, Sports 225 YouTube channel where I archive old shows, including the first time you were on last year. Right, the and and I'm way behind on that. So, you know, and thanks to Nils Breckhoff for pushing the buttons. Um, do you see LSU winning the national championship? At this point, I don't see anyone else between them and Ohio State. I think Ohio State's the only challenger. Uh, Ohio State, I'm an AP top 25 ranker. Uh, I, 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 uh, What'd you submit, vote this week then? This week was LSU one, Ohio State was two. And Ohio State was before LSU beat Auburn. They were my number one, and I think they are a very dominant, complete team. And uh, I, th I think it, once Chase Young will eventually return to that team, and they're going to be a presence. Uh, I think <laughs> I, I can't tell you right now from uh, who will win that game, but I do think they're very evenly matched because I still think we still have a lot to see from Ohio State once they play the Penn States and Michigans and perhaps in Minnesota. But um, at this point, I don't see anybody else who is at a higher level of playing than LSU. For um, somebody who just started this gig two, two seasons ago, this is your second season, you've, you've had an awful lot of fun. It's been <laughs> it's great. I mean, you know, you talk about just timing being the key to life, you know, I mean. You know, and that's one of the things. I wanted to come down here and cover a program that's going to have a lot of stories, and they haven't 
disappointed. And you know, it's it's uh, it's it's definitely interesting. I, I mean, whenever I got here, there was always the talk that they weren't going to do well. Ed Ogeron was going to be fired. You know, then you're going to have to cover a coaching search, and it's been the antithesis of that. It's been the complete right. opposite. So um, that gives you the uh, ability to to write about things that people are putting in their cabinets for for years. Absolutely. Know? And uh, if you ever have to do a college football coaching search, which I don't know if you ever have, <laughs> just shoot me. As, as a sports writer, just shoot me. I did a couple LSU football searches and way too many I uh, felt like on the basketball side and other things. But anyway, you're a fabulous guest, great sports writer. Great to have you. Thank you so much. Yeah, I appreciate your time, man. Thanks for having me on. Brooks Cabina. Follow him at Twitter, at bcabina. Read his stuff at theadvocate.com or buy the newspaper or go to nola.com and watch us every week. I'm Lee Feinswag. Thanks for watching Sports 225. At Carnival Time by Baton Rouge Bay, that's the site of my story. At Spanish Town Mardi Gras, things can get blurry. See the moors marching, prizes fill the sky. This Spanish Town Mardi Gras, may it never die.